Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Stewart. I'm here to welcome you to the first reading in the Tradition Now series. A lot of people, departments, programs, and grants come together to make a reading series happen. And tonight would not be possible without the generous support of the Kogan Institute, Zucker Family Endowment, the Marshall Woods Lectureship Foundation for the Arts, the Swear Center, and the Shane Family Fund. I'd also like to thank my co-instructor, Elizabeth Rush, um, and this wonderful team that we have, Ellen, Aaron, and Emily. Lastly, I want to thank the remarkable students in the Nonfiction Now class who have given such attention to the work um, in a good way. Tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from one of my favorite poets, Diana Coy Nguyen. Diana is a poet and multimedia artist. Her debut poetry collection, Ghost Up, was a finalist for the National Book Award in the LA Times Book Review. This collection of poems and images explores her grief after losing her younger brother to suicide. Grief is an act of repetition. It lingers on certain memories, replaying them over and over, and gradually, sometimes invisibly, changing them. There is a moment in Diana's prose where she seemingly can't get past a phrase or a word. She repeats it over and over. It becomes strange, disassociated from its meaning, eroding into the sound. At these moments, I'm reminded of those old statues of saints whose feet are worn down, not by the weather, but by pilgrims who journeyed hundreds of miles over hundreds of years to put their lips to the stone and gradually change them. Ghost of is a book that rewards rereading. Diana is able to, with the dexterity of a stage magician, switch locations and times, and sometimes it's as if the people are still while the world transforms around them. These shifts are subtle, and they often require a certain slowness from the reader, a meditative attention, a willingness to let the familiar be made strange. Please welcome me and joining me. Thank you so much, Michael and Elizabeth, for inviting me into this space. My gosh, I don't even know most of you. Thanks for being here. Uh, it's such an honor just to get to talk and read. And my favorite part is the Q&A. Um, I feel a little bit overwhelmed. Um, so I had a baby in June. It was my first time being away. I feel like I'm sharing that just because it's a human fact. And when you said pilgrim, I was thinking um, we named the child Peregrine. And the root for the word Peregrine comes from pilgrim or wanderer because the Peregrine falcon is found on every continent except for Antarctica, and I was like, if you didn't know that fact, now you know it. <laughs> Etymology, writers, am I right? Um, so I'm gonna start, read two poems from the book, but because this series is called Nonfiction Now, I was actually gonna veer away from a kind of classified collection of poetry. I mean, I'm still writing poems, but kind of share some other work that I've been doing that I consider various forms of nonfiction, which is like to say, I'll be sharing new work which continues kind of the family um, threads and the diaspora kind of conversations I've been having and doing. Um, are, is everybody able to hear me okay, especially in the back? Okay. Yeah, okay. So is that voice even better? Cool. I see people way out in the back. Do you want to try to come in? Also, I was saying this earlier when I visited the class, like, you guys didn't even come and sit up front here. I'm only going to show one video with no sound. Because um, it's weird to linger at the threshold. Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to check the phone for time. All right. A bird in Chile and elsewhere. There's no ecologically safe way to mourn. Some plants have nectaries that keep secreting pollen even after the petals have gone. Like a flower that grows only in the invisible, the whole world of its body noiselessly shaking against the dust. I'm going to read the triptych, the first triptych that appears in the book. And folks don't 
do not need to follow along if you don't want to. But if you're unfamiliar, um, I've been working with, or had been working with, just photographic images within my family, specifically images where my brother cut himself out two years before he took his own life in 2014. Um, and so it's called a triptych because there's three parts, right? There's the first image, then there's kind of like the text body, and then there's what I consider um, the poem, if it could be the framework around the one who is no longer here. Um, and I always like to explain this, especially for folks who aren't familiar the work, with the work. It'll make sense when I read, because I do read um, the fissure within the piece as well. Triptych. Mindful of the setting, he counted off the seconds in his head as the solitary bee struggles to fly inside the walls of an empty house. Her sister's dead below her. No wind, no rain, we stayed. Framing, an act of enclosing, of closing off yourself from your environment and all the unintended sounds. Car stereos, solitary bird in the tree, the male mouse alone in his cell who detects the trace of a female, pattering rain. Neighbors upstairs spilling rice across the floors and slipping constantly. The drone of sister bees in the walls of your room, lost for weeks, months, and each afternoon you wake to find a new bee on your windowsill, all wings still and all the days unfold like this until you are not at the window, but the dead bees continue to come still, coming to a moment of our attention, framing, to get lost between the walls and open the mind to music. One must remove oneself or framing will remove you. You could not remove the bee that kept reappearing. The sisters were unending. You could not remove the drone, the hum inside your mind. You removed your mind, open the mind, all sounds, are music. I am listening to a needle drop. 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 I am listening to. I am dropping all the needles. I keep on dropping the needles. I have always dropped the. The needles. the needles are stacked in my palm, in the palm of my hand, of my mind. My hands enclose the environment of the needles. What can you hear in the amplified cactus of this palm of mine? Pay attention. Each time the thrums of a dishwasher are different. Let me not be the only listener wishing that the music could go on a little longer. Unintended sounds and all. Let me not be the only, let me not be, let me not, this stupid amplified cactus begging for some new approach to framing, to listening, to unintended, unattended, I will listen to you listening in a moment of attention to life. My mind is open to the fact. Let me beg, let me blur these boundaries between I mean, life and soundlessness, I will do all the exercises. I will listen to all that drops. Please be not art, but life be life. Please be here. A simple explanation for resistance. Our human ears have own ability to unfamiliar sounds. When you hear these sounds and feel trapped, you must remove yourself from what surrounds you. These sounds, these sounds, we have vulnerability to unfamiliar. Remove yourself from frames, remove the frame. Remove the do not panic. Do not panic is the simplest explanation, the simplest resistance to music. Do not simply resist, resist. We who are free to move around, who are free, bewilder. We bewilder what we fill in, what bewilders us to fill in, what You know, I heard once um, that when an animal gets shot, it shivers, um, as if the sight of violence, the bodies, um, needs to shake it off, even if it doesn't continue. Um, I don't know why I was thinking about that, because I, I shivered when I finished reading that, because in some ways, moving with the text around the wound within the photograph, 
I just like I felt it in my body. I don't always, you know, like I, I read different places, um, which is all to say, like, thanks for listening um, and being here with me. So I was talking with students in this nonfiction now class, and um, I continue to revisit these pictures that my brother, where my brother cut himself out, but also. Um, Several years ago, I can't talk and do stuff at the same time. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, um, I like uncovered my family's home videos and digitized them. Uh, so these were like DV tapes and VHS, kind of uh, old, old school technology. Um, and nobody had seen them since they were made. It was, it was kind of a treasure trove. For some reason, I don't know why my parents weren't interested. Maybe they were just like, it was inertia, like they're just kind of lazy. But I was captivated in part because here is the record which contrasts with my own memory of these events as a child, but also my brother is alive. Um, so I started doing this kind of like auto-ethnographic documentation as I was watching. Um, and it was like, surprise, really emotional. <laughs> you know, for somebody who was like actually not super emotional as, like, as, as I go through life. So I'm gonna, this is gonna play in the background as I'm reading it. It doesn't necessarily, it's not supposed to sync up in any way. Um, and you could choose where you want your eyes to be, I guess. Um, yeah, okay, so I'm gonna, and this is just an excerpt from a piece called After the Fact. <coughs> Woman's hands holding a bowl beneath a stream of tap water, jade bracelets slipping from the crease in her forearm to her wrist. How does the human arm work? What are the names of the bones? How many bones? These bones of mine. Will it work? Parts of a robotic arm still work. What parts of the arm do push-ups work? It's a complex, particularly inarticulate condition. Perhaps because Kay feels, I won't believe her, she won't believe me yet. She's spontaneous, I'm sincerely watching. I don't need to question her story. I don't need to question the reality. Every video is a document. We simply revel in movement. Video conveys truth if we decide it does. Simply reveal in the moment, moving from the world around us. My hand like a clasp at her back. We are moving away from, moving toward each other, into these other worlds, realms. Finite pleasure, infinite possibility. In the pleasure moving, Video, a blank video, released on video. Video, videri, vidi, visus, a, um, to see, to seem, passive. We see all kinds of interactions, our human, our body's document, our human document. I walk toward the gray waves, turning back only once. O watches me and starts after. He was watching, was he always watching me? Children do that at that age. The world pours into them, into their open record. He watches and starts after me. Our shoulder blades sharply rise and fall. Out of the frame, D asks, tell me the boy who makes you feel. Should I tell you how this boy makes me feel? What could cause shoulder blade pain? What causes pain between? What does it mean when you have pain between your shoulder blades? Why do I have a pain in my should? What does a scapula do? How many scapula bones? Blade or wing bone always connected or paired? Videos convey truth if we decide they do. Escort together ways. O watches and starts. Our blades rise and fall. Video calls on us to believe. Except this world is actual. Copy and original are just strings in different locations. I exist of strands of him and her. O exists of strands of him and her. O exists. We are strands in different locations, different directions. Video calls us to this world we inhabit and share, accept it as actual. We take pleasure not just from document, but direction as well. He runs back toward the shore, wings outstretched against the wind I follow after. He looks back, he is looking, he looks, he looks to see if alone, a basis for belief. We see what was there before the camera. It must be true. An image cannot tell everything we want to know. What happened? Images can be altered during, after the fact. They ask us to do what they want. There is heat in all interaction. 
This day laughing mid-command. This day quizzing us on birth dates. Okay, O, oh, kick. O, oh, come here. I'm writing to make the process of perception perceptible to me. In 1997, benzene was detected in deep space. Those related to benzene comprise a diverse family. Hoffman used the word aromatic to designate this dynamic. I like that in video we express ourselves as witnesses in transition. Five of us in a row eating cake in silence. We feed ourselves and one of us feeds another. A pitcher of flowers obscures Kay's face. Her hair falls forward each time she lifts the plate toward her face. Aromatic molecules are very stable. They do not break apart easily to react with others. Poems aren't true. Is the video true? True to whom? Reality itself represents itself. I think of myself as a prop placed on a stool in the chair. Kay shoves my knees apart or she slams together. I wake the I wipe the cake off my shin. Care is required for witness. I think of myself as a recording device. I simultaneously record while representing over and over again. I record over and over. I do not record over, however nonchalant I appear. In action, we wordlessly ask them to do what we want. Actions can grow louder. What do we want? What am I doing? What am I wanting? The more compassion I have for myself, the sooner I can. When does D recover? And I'm just gonna kind of pause there. This actually happened. I was like watching that beach uh, moment, and then you know, like, then all of a sudden it cut to cake, and I was like, I like this. It just it just felt right, right? Because I mean, clearly, my sister had a tantrum, and then it stopped, and then the next time my dad started recording was for this kind of like video self-portrait. I mean, we have like these live pictures now on our iPhones, but back then my dad would just set up a video camera to like watch it, like some kind of long exposure watching us eat cake. Um, anyway, um, yeah, okay. So I'm gonna read some new work that's appearing um, in the forthcoming collection. Um, and it's called misinformation, because I was thinking about, well, a lot of things. And what misinformation looked like within my family history. And when I say my family history, I mean before even I was born. Um, and it's like interwoven with some more recent things as well. Okay. Is my volume still OK in the back? Cool, thank you. It's very different to read while trying to project. So it's a different kind of experience um, with the work. I kind of like having the family up, so I'm just going to leave that up. It's like a little altar, so to speak. Misinformation. Spring. A woman in suede pumps takes down every painting, revealing ghosts on the wall where frames used to hang. Files rent in thin white strips falling like ash curl along embassy corridors. A man adjusts his glasses, packs a satchel, the click of its buckle like a voice choking behind closed doors. He walks the same way home, gathering his family the way an open palm sweeps stray grains of rice into one corner of the room. The Americans offer to take us with them, he says, though he doesn't know why. His children do not know what he has seen. They wake and sleep to blooming bombs, whistling missiles, war, an instrument whose sound is only heard by those who play it. We are winning, my grandfather says. The South will not lose this war. Maps gave me a wrong turn, so I ended up somewhere else, I tell my friend in a cafe downtown. Outside, a truck slows at the light, white paint leaking from it like a car door shut against a wedding dress, a torn flag thrashing in the wind. How's the country? she asks. How could you leave the city? I tell her about canoes face down atop buggies, how I'm writing lines with white space all around, how there's one main road, one park, one candy shop, 
how at the pharmacy, a man approached, Gerber formula shaky in his hands. Is this okay for an Asian baby, he asks. When he was a boy, the man I love, who grew up with many sisters, drew a picture of his family, a stick beside three dogs. I'm an orphan, he told his third grade teacher. How we came together, a man at the edge of a lake, three dogs swimming, the fog dipping its hem into water. These myths shift imperceptibly each time we recall them. Scored along the fault lines of memory, we pick up where we left off, unaware of what has changed. I'm an orphan, my brother said, to a couple who owned the small company where he worked in the years leading up to his suicide. The same couple sitting in my parents' living room two years after he died. We took him in as one of us, they said. He was a model worker. When he tried to quit, we didn't let him. Your brother is lost, my mother says, because we didn't believe him. He told us there was a loud humming inside the walls. Go to sleep, we said, and he couldn't go to sleep. Yesterday, your father and I found dead bees inside the attic, thousands. Once, when he was still alive, I found a dead bee on the windowsill of our bathroom. Not thinking much of it, I swept it into the trash with my palm, a motion captured in the dust like after image. The next morning, a dead bee on the windowsill, the other still in the bin. I told no one. I told your grandfather to take my brothers and go, my mother says, so they wouldn't get conscripted. She would stay and help my grandmother with the family business, a pharmacy. One by one, her younger sisters chose to stay and help my mother, dominoes falling into place. After he left, the war ended. There was nothing, no pharmacy. A woman and five daughters hiding in the dark. Wind swept through empty alleys, boarded shops. Asked to ask a neighbor for some rice, my mother watched the tanks roll in, boys in uniform raising over the dead who had been swept off to one side. Out in Texas hill country, I am squatting over a kiddie pool filled with ice, noodling for beer. The birthday boy mans a royal and crawdad pot, and his five-year-old son loading clay pigeons into the trap as the eyes of rifles trace and fire. Kids rumbling around the fields in dirt bikes without helmets. In the dust, a woman calls out to her black dog using a racial epithet. Like a bird loaded into the trap, I'm frozen in place, hoping no one sees me. But everything goes on just the same. Shirtless men teach me horseshoes. Gently, a wife stores cheesecake in the fridge for later. I pee a little in my boots when we take shots after sundown because I am jumping. Jumpy. A black neighbor joins late. Everybody's glad to see him. Hey, Frank, they say. The dog comes over to check out the stranger, and they sweetly greet each other. What's your name, boy? The man asks. Frank, a woman replies. Let me be Frank. At readings in front of strangers and friends, I tell the story about bees each time the words are different. The hum of each crowd different. We are here with each other, and there's so much we do not say. At my brother's funeral, I didn't hold my mother's hand. I held my brother's hand. I didn't hold my brother's hand. No one held my hand. So now I'm moving more to work that <laughs> I call these um, they're like little prose bricks, you know, um, I guess technically they're prose poems, but I was more interested in like, how might a poem proceed if it doesn't look like a poem anymore? So how might that change our relationship to a sentence? Um, mostly because I, I mean, with the triptych, it was all about working with like the image. Um, and so I, I had been working on the series and it's called Doi Moi which refers to the period of kind of economic um, kind of reform in Vietnam 
towards the end of the 80s after kind of sanctions were lifted and um, that's like the Wikipedia entry kind of definition of doi moi. And for me, as somebody who grew up speaking Vietnamese, and then it was forbidden once I turned five because my s parents were scared I would become an ESL student in kindergarten. Um, like s as for somebody who has a language and then is kind of loses that language and then reacquires it in this kind of like feral way. I call feral as like somebody, it's like a wild creature that's been domesticated. So that's my relationship to the Vietnamese language. My understanding of doi moi is more of like, kind of like a new time, a new phase. And so I was really like, I don't know, just the convergence of those two historical and personal things. That was a long preamble for, for this kind of writing. I'm just gonna read two of these blocks and then I will end with maybe <coughs> what, it, with, with fiction that's really nonfiction. <laughs> we could talk about this in the Q&A <laughs> among other things. Okay, doi moi. At the site where the wound will occur, we know that she was in the garden, the one she had cultivated, seed by seed. Shortly after moving in with her husband and their 11 children, all of them together again after years of separation. Her husband's and son's feet in America, her daughter's and hers in Vietnam, first in Saigon, then a place unmentioned by the coast, underground, in hiding, waiting to make a successful bribe so they might board a vessel, any vessel, collective bride in dark waters facing an unknown stage. Boom, boom, she whispered to my mother. Butterfly, the word my mother used to reference our genitals, two cupped wings like a heartbeat. Boom, boom. In hiding all that year unmentioned by the coast, my mother as a young girl had her first period, its dark liquid unseen in their nest underground. Boom, boom, the smear of red between my thighs, perfectly symmetrical. Two lips pressed together as if to kiss or to strike. Um, so I shared that my child is named Peregrine and we call her Little Bird as like our, our little nickname. Also, another fun fact, did you know that a baby Peregrine is called an Ias? That's an amazing word. Okay, somebody new at the door. Uh, if you didn't know, please use this word, baby falcons, Iases, spelled E-Y-A-S. Um, so in Vietnamese, because I'm, I'm trying to only speak Vietnamese to the child when I'm around my parents, so we, we, we had been calling her Kong Chim, which is like, you know, like, like little bird or child bird. And then I was like hanging out with other Vietnamese, like American writers, Vicky Nao, one of them, I think she kind of came and visited last year. And she started laughing because in Vietnamese, Kong Chim is a slang for penis. <laughs> so this whole time, these past four months, I've been calling my child penis. <laughs> we still do it, just so you know. And so I went to my parents after Vicky now told me this, and they're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> and I was like, what? They're like, just don't say it out in public. And I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, so, so funny the, the kind of idioms we use for like body parts and so forth. Well, I talked about butterfly. Anyway, um, you just, yeah, we just learned some cultural facts there. So be careful what you say when you go to Vietnam, I guess, or hang out with Vietnamese people. Um, so I shared this with the class. Um, I was really inspired by the director, filmmaker, Lee Isaac Chung, um, who did Minari. And he described his process for making that movie as just starting out by writing 100 memories. I think it took him kind of a while. And once he did that, he kind of like took a step back and then saw like a very specific thread, took those memories, and then assembled what then became Minari. And I was like, I'll do that. I don't know what else I'm doing. You know, like I'm kind of working with family history anyway. Um, so I started doing that. And like once you start, like the memories do start to pour out, things you hadn't thought about in a long time. And so I've been working on this kind of, um, it's a prose project. Um, I, I'm calling it a ghost story, but I haven't gotten to plot yet, probably because I'm a poet. So I've been doing these kind of character memory pieces and I couldn't write it unless I renamed everybody in my family. So that's why it's fiction, but <laughs> it's just all of us with different names. <laughs> so 
I mean, I think that's kind of a lot of novels, actually. So, you know, um, there's something, too, about playing with the dollhouse, you know, like even though it's you. I don't know how to describe it, but perhaps we could have that discussion. And so this is from, this is now a scene thinking about siblings. There's three siblings, Grace, Wanda, and Pip. I'm Grace. Um, <laughs> okay. Grace and Wanda, and Wanda and Pip. Before Pip was born, Grace and Wanda shared the bedroom across the bathroom, even though there were three bedrooms outside of their parents' suite on the second floor. When the house was still being built by their parents on the weekends with the help of a few hired laborers, Grace played inside a cardboard box large enough to fit a refrigerator. The box was in the middle of the driveway, which wasn't paved yet. It was only flattened dirt, and when she was inside the box, she felt as though she was in a house size just for her, like one of those all-weather dog houses she saw in people's backyards, though she never saw a dog inside one of them. Wanda would copy Grace's movements, following her like a shadow. Wordlessly, Grace would lie down inside the box, and Wanda would lie down inside the box. Grace would climb out and push it to the shade, and Wanda would climb out and place her hands behind Grace's, the two of them pushing like a dog sled in reverse, except they were neither Malamute nor Husky. But like the two breeds, the sisters were similar yet different. They both had straight black hair, originating in the climate of Din's extreme mood swings and unforgiving rules, relaxing only when they were alone with Ha. At birth, both parents had been disappointed to discover their female sex. Grace was fast at everything she did, as if moving quickly could hold her thoughts at bay, whereas Wanda was the slowest person in the house, so absorbed in her thoughts that when someone spoke to her, she seemed confused, as if she found herself suddenly in a foreign country where she didn't speak the language. Then, as is the case now, ask Wanda what she is thinking, and she will stare blankly before saying, I don't know. And it's true. It's as if she doesn't know how to translate between the two realms. How is it that she exists in both worlds? They used to play this game at night, their twin beds parallel to each other in the small bedroom where one would call the other's name and the other would respond by calling the other's name. This way they would know if the other was still awake or fast asleep. Wanda, Grace, Wanda. Grace, Wanda, Grace, Grace. When Pip came home from the hospital after his birth, he was the bedroom across from Grace and Wanda who continued to share a small bedroom. When Grace's body began to change, Ha noticed, not because of any change in the landscape of Grace's body, there was none, but because she could now smell her distinctly. Wanda and Pip were changing too, as children do, but isn't it true that parents seem to take particular notice of the eldest child because each new year is unprecedented? Din and Ha's mistake was in thinking that each child traversed the same terrain. As when driving along an unknown narrow winding road, a driver takes extreme caution at every hairpin turn, wondering where the path will straighten out again. Upon driving it again and again, the driver begins to feel comfortable, anticipating the familiar curves, ascents and descents, and it is dangerous the moment the, dri the driver drives as if automatically. Grace successfully petitioned her parents to grant her the third bedroom as her own. By then, she had stopped playing with her siblings and instead retreated into the world of novels, listening to talk radio late at night with the volume on low. Wanda wanted to call out to Grace, and this impulse kept her awake. The absence in her room made the room feel even smaller, as if she were back in that refrigerator box in the dirt, except she no longer had the body of Grace to follow. Wanda clim climbed out of bed and crept out into the hallway. First, she arrived at Grace's room, standing in the doorframe, listening for the steady, deep breathing she knew well. Then Wanda visited Pip, Stepping into his room so that, th had the lights been turned on, she would have had his bed on her line of sight. She waited for him to rustle in the sheets as she had never been able to hear his breath. When she finally approached her parents' suite, where the low sounds of her father's snoring were occasionally joined by her mother turning in bed, 
Wanda instinctively dropped to the carpet in all fours and began an incremental crawl toward them. Like a bat, Wanda knew which body moved in the dark because sound conveys the measurements of distance. Like the child that she was, Wanda crawled toward sounds familial to her. For several years, only Pip knew about Wanda's sleepless walking. At first, he didn't mention anything, but one night, as Wanda stepped closer inside his room, Pip refrained from moving for a long moment. Then he said, I know it's you. A long pause in which Wanda didn't know what to say. Then Pip again, I do this too, except during the day when no one is asleep. Well, sometimes Grace is napping. After that night, they never spoke about it explicitly, but when Wanda appeared in Pip's room from time to time, they each said nothing but felt each other's presence. Wanda never stayed very long, and Pip could sense her path in the dark between the other rooms as if reading the change in the water where a fish has recently swam. Eventually, Wanda would return to bed, and Pip, without moving, knew exactly the moment when she fell asleep. As soon as her lids closed, his did too. If the family was a whale, his was its tail, last to re-enter night's cool waters. Thank you. I realized my screensaver was teaching you all Vietnamese, and I was like, let's just, let's do it. <laughs> um, so I think it's a pretty informal Q&A. Um, I know that my work deals with um, a suicide in the family, which is very personal material. Um, I don't wish for you to shy away from asking me personal questions. I have yet to receive an inappropriate one, not a challenge. Um, but I can, I can definitely adroitly sidestep if I need to, which is to say I'm, I'm granting kind of permission. Um, but just happy to talk about anything, really. So I'm here for you before we go off into the evening. Um, yeah, but thank you again for having me. Um, it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, and I read a lot of new work. I felt weird. Yeah, in the back by the window. Um, how did you decide to uh, form a narrative around a personal experience that was, you know, your experience, but a narrative, you know, that had a beginning, middle, and end, more or less, in your story? Uh, how is that true to you and also a separate work? Are you talking about, like, the last piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out what the narrative is. Like I said, like, I'm still working through these memories in some ways that aren't mine, <coughs> right? Like, like Grace is not really a part of that sibling dynamic. Um, and I'm trying to work myself toward, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm at a tributary and I'm working my way back to the river and hope that it's not an oxbow, you know? Um, yeah, I don't even know. I feel like I kind of lost track of your question. I don't know where I'm going, honestly. I know, I know that in the story, at some point I'm gonna cover the terrain of where the, the family members are in the present when Pip is no longer alive and it's gonna be eight years after um, he's been dead and the eldest sister receives a text message from his number and they have to figure out like, well, they don't have to. The daughter's like, oh, that's just a coincidence. You know, like telemarketers call you with a number that looks just like yours. So it's kind of like that, but then the parents are like, oh no, it's him, he's contacting us. And so it's kind of this convergence of how different generations address this kind of technological mishap, but also we get a snapshot of like these people, you know, eight years after a member has died um, and how they've moved on or, or not and so forth. Um, I was like talking to my agent earlier today and I was like, I'm trying to get to the plot, but I'm still stuck in the memories, you know? I don't think I answered your question. Do you want to ask a follow-up question? Yeah, how do, you, how do you separate, you know, a memory from kind of the narrative you're trying to construct? And how do you do yeah. justice? Yeah, you know, okay. I'm not an artist. Like, like I, don't, I don't do like drawing or painting. I, when I say artist. Um, and I remember this exercise I did in middle school where you take part of a leaf or something and then like you're supposed to like draw the rest of the leaf. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, okay, 
there's probably like a name for this exercise. I think it's no different. So like the memories become that fragment of a leaf that I laid down. And as I begin to describe the leaf, my sentence is now going off, off the place of what is already there in the memory. And I'm now moving into this kind of like phantom leafdom. Oh my God, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. Like I'm moving into the phantom leafdom. And then I'm like, oh, it's a maple tree. No, it's not a maple tree. It's an elm tree. No, it's an alder tree. And then it's like, no, it's actually like a palm tree. <laughs> you know, um, there's this, what is it, Stanley Kunis line? Like all trees are pine trees except for oak trees or something like that, which is a really kind of funny contradiction. So it's kind of like you start where you do know. And it's as if the sentence is always a step ahead of you. This is the case for me. I don't mean like you specifically. And then I'm just like, oh, I'm not going to course correct. I'm just going to continue to go. OK, more poetry, poet, things that I've learned that I also pass on. I forget who said this one, but I'll look it up. And the quote goes, like a piece of ice on a hot stove, the poem arrives like, at its kind of destination. I kind of butchered it. But I love this notion of like, you don't know where the ice is going to move in the stove unless you know like the exact tilt of your, of your oven, right? And then there's like all these like kind of physics that go into like what, what kind of water and so forth. And I love this idea of like, I'm just going to follow this melting piece of ice, you know? You know that it's going to take up this amount of space, but you, yeah, you don't know where it's going to go. Anyway, I answered, you, I answered this with like in a weird metaphorical kind of way, but those things kind of guide my, my process. Yeah, and there's a hand right here. Yeah, I was like, what's that appreciate your like, little bird story? My dad was like called Blackbird growing up in the family, like as a very like, teasing, kind of mean nickname, because like, he's <laughs> like a skin kid. Oh no. Yeah, I was like, not great. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh yeah, that resonated. Um, and I guess my question is like, how do you find like the space, and, like emotional care to be writing all these things, and how does that feel? Like, how do you like deal with the mental health aspect? Of that? Oh yeah, huge. I mean, I just like, I read you like, a geological sampling of work I've been doing over like the last six years. Um, but huge swaths of time occur between even like sections of a piece, right? Um, which is to say, like w when I first started watching that home video and I was like describing, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this like self-documentary thing. I'm gonna track what I'm seeing and track what I'm feeling and then like see what happens. And then all of a sudden like I'm crying and I don't know why I'm crying. I'm like, okay, you just have to stop and walk away. And maybe in that moment, I don't return to that project until like the next six months later, right? I mean, this is like the privilege of maybe not necessarily having a deadline. It's different, like as a student, you're like, oh, got to turn in a thing by this date or you're late or whatever. Right? Um, but like as I navigate and move through family material, I don't know what I'm going to actually encounter, even if I've seen it before, because you don't know what's going to get pulled up from like the memories. Um, and you just have to be careful. Like I remember I was actually doing that video work at a residency in somewhat isolation in Taos, New Mexico. And it was like not a great place for me physically too because I, I swim and that's a big part of my mental health. But there was a pool bully at the local pool. <laughs> when I say pool bully, I, I'm not trying to get sympathy. But like these, these people exist um, like where they're like, that's my lane, you know? And it's like, it's a public pool! And then they won't share their lane. And then the life, even the lifeguard's like, just go in that lane. And I'm like, hell fucking no. <laughs> I'm getting in that lane. But that takes a lot of labor to do. And so I was doing this like every other day, like fighting this pool bully, you know? And like he would occasionally kick me when he was like, you know, swimming by. You know, and I'm just like, stay my course and be the thorn in his side. But like, I'm angry, right? I guess it's not therapeutic anymore. I'm angry. Sorry. Um, so. Okay, this is a long, this is a long, this is a, so I was experiencing that at the pool and then I was like doing this video stuff and like really like having a hard time and I realized this is when I instituted this rule, like before I dive into the difficult material, I need to have an intro ritual of self-care and actually afterwards I need to have an outro ritual and while I'm doing it, I need to tell some friends that I'm doing it so they can check in. And this is something like nobody's in school or like make sure you take care of yourself or like how does that look like? Um, it helped to like be like, okay, it's like I'm gonna put on the bunny suit or like I don't know what the full hazmat suit. But, like I'm gonna put on this suit before I enter and then I'm gonna take it off when I'm like I'm done. And maybe you have a set amount of time that you're gonna work on it. Um, so those strategies have helped me, not just in, like the pros, but anything. Um, but as soon as I start to feel, I ask like, do I wanna keep going? You know, because 
I don't need to like re-traumatize myself in order to make. I don't think that that's actually useful. Um, yeah, I, I hope that that, I hope, that, yeah, so then it's just figuring out like I think um, what acts you can do and people who can check in and, and support you. And then of course like I'm talking to my therapist about all of this too, you know, um, yeah. And so sorry about the colorism. <laughs> and yeah, um, I could go into many more stories when my child was born about how, how, how white she was. Anyway, that's its own. Yeah, there's a hand in the back. Hey, um, <coughs> so um, first of all, I just wanted to say I really love uh, the, the readings that you presented, um, particularly in uh, the references, I want to say in the second piece to Benzine and like Widero. Oh, yeah. And like Wideo Widere. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, though, is your performance, so to speak, of the, the triptychs were so um, intentional um, with the, the sort of meter and the, the pauses that you were taking. And that wasn't something I was able to pick up when I saw it visually. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, like, what's your sort of take on, you know, like being able to see the writing versus being able to hear the writing? And do you think something is lost along the way when you have to put something that, you know, may be meant to be heard mm -hmm. into a visual form? Yeah, thank you for that question, and, and thank you for noticing the benzene. Uh, I, I was telling the class, like, I go in these weird tangents, and I don't know where, like, I am really, like, I know nothing about science, you know? Like, my spouse, who's a biochemical engineer, he's always like, oh, yeah, your, your poet logic is, that, is, is manifesting itself again when I say something about science. Um, but sometimes I go down these deep dives, and then, like, I don't know what it was. I think it was the word aromatic family when I was reading about benzene. And then that made me think about my family, because I think I was talking to the class about how you never know how you'll turn back to look at your material, even when you're so far afield. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make a note there. Um, and also, yeah, props to Latin nerds um, out there. Yeah, peace. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, so your question about the performance or the audiovisual kind of aspect versus like a, a reader kind of reading it on their own. Um, when I wrote them, I had no idea how they would be read because I didn't actually ever plan to read them. I, I did the work mostly like, to, like for me, for myself, because like those pictures haunted me and my sister. And so like I, I was like exchanging it with her. Um, so I didn't think too much of it, right? Like, and, and you know, it's kind of, I'm, I'm a very, also a very literal person. Like, the cuts in the work only occur because like I'm writing right over the photograph. And then when I get to the white space in the photograph, like I have to literally like cut my word to jump over to the next part, right? Because I'm only writing where there's the photographic image. And so when it came like, you know, if we're gonna fast forward to now when the poem appears in a book, I was like, oh, how am I gonna read this? Well, let's do it literally. You read and you have that like rhythm of like the, the, the line, the lines accumulating. And then when you get to the cliff, I have to read the cliff. Um, and doing that opened up a n whole new experience for me. I didn't even know, right? Because I was like, oh my God, that totally mimics grief. They're not intentional. It's kind of an accident because I was really just copying the image. It mimics grief because you're living your life, right? Every day you wake up, you do X, Y, Z, Monday, Tuesday, right? All the days of the week. And then an, a sudden death happens. That's the rupture. But then you like, you have to go back to work. You're supposed to go, you're supposed to go <coughs> back to school or, you know, you're supposed to continue eating, sleeping somehow, maybe. And so when the line picks up again, I was like, oh, that's, that is what it's like. It's like I'm running at full speed in my life and then there's a cliff and I have to stop so I don't die. But then I have to step over that, right, that valley and then continue. And then, like, I'm running again. And then all of a sudden, like, the help desk person I just called, his name is Oliver. And that's my brother's name. And then I'm at the cliff again. Do you know what I mean? And then sometimes there's lots of cliffs. Sometimes there aren't. Um, and weird that that, like, formal thing that was happening in the poem does capture that, which was not intentional. So I don't know. You know, like... Um, so I guess your question was like that divide between experience. You know, I don't control what happens to the piece. 
um, I kind of welcome however people want to encounter it, you know, um, which is to say, like, I'm not a control freak about, like, oh, it must be received, <laughs> you know, in this way. I think, um, I think of it like, it, like mushroom spores. Okay, that's a weird analogy. But, like, it's going to go off into people's imaginations and do its own thing. And I'm, I'm just happy that it exists and that people do spend time with it. So that's enough for me, you know. Um, each time I read it, it's actually a different experience. Sometimes I'm feeling it, sometimes I'm not. Um, sometimes I get the, the cliff a little bit wrong, and that's, that's OK, too. Uh, which is also why when I do the video and the reading of that benzene piece, I, like, I don't want it to be synced. Uh, I think the asynchronicity is, like, bears much more verisimilitude to kind of the ongoing process that is, like, me as human in the world. I feel like I avoided your question, but I tried. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have a question. Like uh, sometimes when I emotionally like, sad, I hard something. Um, so my experience is like the sad part. I write everything down, and then just five minutes later, I think, oh my god, this this are all nonsense. Has it ever happened to you? How do you deal with that? Yeah. You know, I'm the opposite. So I try not to feel feelings. Um, maybe in part because I grew up in a household where there wasn't a naming. Um, nobody acknowledged you <laughs> if you felt a feeling, right? So there was a kind of like a, an erasure, so to speak, um, which didn't mean that they didn't exist. It just meant that nobody existed with you in those feelings. And I think I grew up in that way. So I'm very process oriented and work oriented because my parents are such hard workers. Um, so like for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to sit down today and I'm going to work with this photograph that scares me. And you know, like I, I have a system in place, you know, like I'm going to do this work. And then maybe like three hours into doing the work, all of a sudden I'm crying. Like the feeling was always there. And I was just so distracted enough that the feeling could emerge. Um, and so, sorry, which is to say, like, because I'm so focused on doing the labor, when I get arrive at the feeling, Perhaps there is a kind of incoherence, but I've already kind of laid the groundwork where there is coherence. Does that kind of make sense? And, and then they're kind of merging. This is something I, I answered in like the class that I visited today. Like, how can I distract myself with something that is coherent and known? Like benzene. <laughs> Look, who knew we were going to talk about benzene, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, I'm thinking about like families and molecules and how things cling together or, or get torn apart and so forth. So maybe another, I'm actually like working my way through possible thing to try. Is like that's just another way of thinking about metaphor, right? And thinking about containers for, for those feelings. But yeah, I mean, I, I would say like when I was a teen or in my early 20s when I was writing, it was a lot of feeling, a lot of rage, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. And I didn't have yet organizing principles to kind of like, um, articulate those things. Um, and I think that those things are valid and, and totally deserve to live. And it's only like later going through school, thinking about sentence separate from those feelings, but then allowing the feeling to kind of come back. I don't know if that's helpful, but um, yeah. I guess it is. So I do not think like this are completely nonsense, but I do feel like oh, this are not, it doesn't feel right or something. Yeah. Or just uh, temporary. I wonder if perhaps another way to think about it, at least I can share from my experiences, I try to provide a scaffold for my feelings. Like if you were trying to grow vines on, a, on your house, I've not done this, but I've watched my mother do it, but you like kind of like just move the tendril like a little bit and you have a little bit of string to help it along. So you're kind of like guide, it's like training wheels, like you're just trying to guide it, but at the same time you're trying to follow where it wants to grow and not tell it where to grow. I hope that, I feel like I'm only answering in weird <laughs> analogies. I don't know how to actually answer questions. So, I mean, I'm also a visual person. Um, I think, like, it's, it's time, but I am happy to, like, sign books. But for folks who do have questions, I can answer your question. Even if you don't have a book, like, you can come up. I just don't want to hold the room. Also, thank you. Be well. Take care of yourselves. Yeah. <laughs>